I have had a particular focus a, a little while in the context of her apparitions and why she's appearing and what's the plan. And I think it's very clear, as Mariana wrote in her book, like what I began in Fatima, I will fulfill in Medjugorje. But that takes in a lot. And I've had, like, the Frenchman who's very popular, Xavier Al and things on the channel. He wrote that book, Revelations. So La Salette and... So I'm aware of a lot, I don't know everything, but I'm aware of a lot. And for me, I think we're very close to a lot of things coming. And I remember in August, you gently said that on the altar. I did. You know, the time is short, make your decision. No, I just mean, <laughs> I just mean that you could die tonight. Ah, yeah. Crossing the road, no. I, Nothing to do with that stuff? No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> on time scales and things. But yeah, I don't want to get a particular folk. I think I've done a bit for it. But let's get back to I, what she I wants. I often get people coming in saying they expect something last October, this March, you know, and so-and-so has said this and that and the other. And I don't find these things useful. And I also actually, I deliberately ignore most of these things. I don't, I don't put any stock or credence in these things. Right. Um, and I don't want to mention names. I remember there was a certain Catholic lay gentleman who has been writing on the internet for years, donkey's years, and he would always predict when the, the warning, according to Garabandal, the apparition that Garabandal was supposed to happen, and every few months he would change it because, you know, <laughs> because it was, it was wrong. So he yeah. had to keep changing his figures. And I thought, this is just silliness. I know he's got good intentions, bless him, but I don't think these things, this is not how we should live the faith. I, no, no. In, um, in a constant expectation of something imminent. The only thing that's imminent is our death and judgment. You know, the four last things. This is what every Catholic should ponder. I really believe that. I, and, uh, and I say that not, not because I'm on camera, but if you understood me last year as though implying something is imminent. I don't mean something apocalyptic or, or even related to the secrets here, because I don't know anything about that, when that's going to come. We know, you know, that uh, the visionaries here have said that it would happen in their lifetimes. And they're not, not exactly spring chickens. You know, the youngest one is my age. Yaakov. So the others would be in their late 50s or maybe even 60 by now. But, uh, and, and, um, no, I, I don't, I really do not indulge in speculating about when things might happen. It is, of course, something about Medjugorje that it, it's invested in the, this, uh, in, in the sense that the from the earliest times, you know, the visionary said they are secrets and they will come true at a certain point. So in a sense, Medjugorje stands or falls with the secrets. If they never happen, people just refuse to believe in Medjugorje, probably, almost certainly. I think most people would cease to believe. But um, I don't see the secrets as the, the main thing for Medjugorje. It's the fruits and the conversions here. You know, there are lots of things, when we, when we look at prophecy, St. Thomas, from my order, St. Thomas Aquinas, he has a maxim that he repeats quite a few times in the Summa, in different contexts, but almost always to do with prophecy and receiving prophecy and how to interpret prophecy. And it is, everything received is received according to the manner of the recipient or everything received, a thing received is received according to the mode of the recipient. Maybe we can translate it that way. And what it means is this. If while we were sat here, someone came in and explained Einstein's theory of special relativity to the two of us, we would both absorb it according to our own modes, you know, according to how much of a science background we might have had, or how sleepy or tired we might be at this moment, or how much we pay attention to him, or how good a communicator he is, but 
but really according to our own mood we would receive something. And we'd come away with different ideas about this, about special relativity. But not just that. Let's imagine if someone came in here and read Alice in Wonderland to the two of us. You and I would come away with two different ideas of that book. Now we already have our preconceived notions about Alice in Wonderland. I don't think I've ever read it actually. Yeah, I've never, never had the patience. Never watched that. <laughs> no, no, I have no idea. You know, I know she gets big, she gets small. I got bored by that stage and I stopped, stopped watching it, stopped reading the book. I, so I have no idea what happens to her in the end. Maybe she's trapped in wherever that is. Where did she go? Wonderland, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the clues in the title. <laughs> um, we both have different ideas, different forms of. Alice in Wonderland that we would receive. Um, and uh, we can't assume, and we must not assume, that everyone would get exactly the same form, the same idea of uh, the thing. We'd receive it according to our capabilities, our own modes. So, for example, St. Bernadette, you know, she receives. Our lady speaks to her in the local patois, in Occitan, you know, the, the, the language of southern France, Languedoc. And, um, and she even remarks on it, Bernadette would say, you know, Our Lady used the vous form, you know, the polite form, with me, you know. And you, and you notice it also in the dialogue, you know, like uh, on, I forget now, is it day three or something? The, there are two ladies who accompany her. And one, and one is fairly well to do. She, she worked herself up. She married well. I forget, Madame Millet. And she brings her seamstress as a witness, you know, and maybe also to carry all the stuff, you know, and, and they're convinced that whoever's appearing, Akero, you know, that Bernadette was careful never to say it was Our Lady until March 25th when, you know, mm. she, I am the Immaculate Conception, when the, the lady identified herself. So Bernadette always called her Akero, that one. That one there. And these two ladies were convinced that it was a friend of theirs who had died the previous October, Elisa, something I forget her name, and um, Elisa, <laughs> who was the former president of the Children of Mary or something, you know. And so they want, and, and, and that sort of thing was very popular at the time, that, you know, the idea of communicating with it. I suppose it's still popular, but it's a, it's a dangerous thing. So they brought paper and a pen <laughs> and ink <laughs> so that Eliza could write down who she was, you know, Akero, that one. And uh, it's very obvious how Madame Millet and Antoinette, the seamstress, they both speak to Bernadette and address as to you, you know, the, the, the common form, the familiar form. But Our Lady, you know, first Bernadette says to her very politely, would you have the kindness to write down your name? <laughs> and uh, and our lady laughs, you know, and then my family is jabbing her like, what did she say? She laughed. <laughs> and she said, it is not necessary. You know, and then she addresses Bernadette and said, would you have the grace to come here for a fortnight? Okay. I know most of the translations say 15 days, Kanju or in, in the dialect, Kans Diaz. In those languages, Italian, Spanish, French, all these Romance languages, 15 days means two weeks, just like eight days means one week. You know? So, so she, she was asking her to come for a period of two weeks, not, to, not for strictly 15 days, because she actually had 18 apparitions in total, which is way more than 15. And Bernadette was struck by this, you know, she, the, the, the graciousness of Our Lady. And Our Lady used words that she understood, or when she used words that she didn't understand, she memorized it. So, well, what is it? Que so era Immaculada Concezio. You know, she had no idea what is Immaculada Concezio. And she had to keep repeating it over and over again. Um, I suppose she said later, yes, I might have heard of the term immaculate, um, and maybe even conception, or maybe even together, the two words, but it didn't mean anything to her. But she received according to her mode and in her language. 
This is a very important principle. Mm -hmm. So the Fatima visionaries, the, um, they received according to their mood. And sometimes, you know, if you have like an ide fix, uh, an overriding obsession, you might not hear what Our Lady or the Saints or Jesus is actually telling you. So, for example, St. Catherine of Siena, of my order, you know, the Dominican order, we were very much against, for a long time, against the idea of the Immaculate Conception, okay, because we saw that Our Lady also had to be redeemed, and she is. But we just couldn't recon reconcile that with an Immaculate Conception. Now, St. Thomas is, a, you know, sometimes he argues against it, but later on he does seem a bit open to it, but the order in general was mostly cautious about this. I wouldn't say against, we were cautious. This mm -hmm. is something the Franciscans still torment us about every Immaculate Conception. I have it thrown in my face by the Franciscans. So St. Catherine of Siena, in, she had an apparition of Our Lady, I think in 1377, and she asked her, are you the Immaculate Conception? And Our Lady said, no, I'm not. Wasn't her. So now, was that a real apparition? Well, St. Catherine is a saint. It's a real apparition. But St. Catherine heard what she wanted to hear, what she believed she would hear. You know, this kind of ide fix, um, kind of overrode whatever else. And we, we see the same thing in Fatima, the, the children there. Now remember, Francisco couldn't hear anything. He had to be told everything from uh, Lucia and Jacinta. Lucia did all the talking mm. to Our Lady. And they said, the war will end on October 13th. They said that beforehand, they said it on the day itself, and they said it even the days following when they were interviewed by the parish priest. They said, yeah, it, it was supposed to end October 13th. Then Jacinta even says, um, I think it'll end this following Sunday, the 21st to 22nd, you know. <laughs> and Lucia, even years later in 1924, says, yes, yeah, we, uh, you know, it, well, it did end shortly after. Well, it ended a year and a month later. You know, that's not shortly after. <laughs> But they, they heard what they wanted to hear. Okay. So now, I think maybe many people might have their faith shaken, but look, St. Thomas tells us this, you know, 700, 750 years ago, more than that. A thing received is received according to the mode of the recipient. Now, I guess a lot of people imagine Lourdes as like this pristine wonderful apparition, and the same with Fatima, you know, no problems. I, you know, if, had I lived back then, I would not have uh, had any problems accepting it. They forget how difficult it was. I mean, Lourdes, the context was when Bernadette had the apparition, immediately there was another 40 or 50 other girls, teenage girls, in that whole region, all, you know, like kneeling down in ecstasy and uh, pretending to have apparitions. It's to that bishop's credit, the Bishop of Tarb, that he was able to discern Bernadette out of all the others, <laughs> you know, and reject all the others. Fatima, they forget how scandalous it seemed to people at the time, you know, and uh, the miracle of the sun, I suppose, was certainly in its favor because, you know, 70,000 to maybe 100,000 people witnessed it, including hostile witnesses. The secular media came and witnessed it. So that helped. Medjugorje is, is in that situation where we are right now, like, like Lourdes and Fatima between the apparition and the approval. You know, I mean, the apparition is still going on here. But it's a time when the church is discerning. And the church, of course, does not forbid us from going. It didn't, it didn't forbid anyone going to see the miracle of the sun, you know. And if they hadn't gone, the church might not have approved Fatima. Because, and then, then, of course, there's the difficulty with why did the children say the war was going to end October 13th or October 22nd or 21st, I forget, you know, and, and then and get it wrong. Um, or in Lourdes, why did Bernadette scrounge about in the dirt and drink muddy water and eat weeds? This yeah. was a scandal for people. 
I think we forget how messy apparitions are. You know, and Medjugorje has its own kind of messiness on all sorts of levels. Um, because of um, human nature, human weakness. I, I, no, no, I don't, I mean all sorts of people. Are, something that we don't really know about is that Medjugorje, like lords, there was a, a spate of fake apparitions. You know, lots of teenage girls, I think, claimed in the region, Herzegovina claimed to have apparitions. Okay. And, uh, because it would do that sort of thing, it would kickstart this sort of hysteria among people, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I the focus on the apop apocalyptic is unhealthy. For me, I wouldn't say apocalyptic, I would say eschatological. Okay, and by that I mean the four last things, I really mean the four last things. You know, we don't know how long we have to, to live. Be converted. Be yeah. converted now. Okay. Don't worry about the future of the world or the church. Don't worry about those things. What can you do by worrying? But there's a lot you can do by being faithful and being converted. Mm -hmm. This is really powerful. I'm not trying to... I know people want something to fixate on or they want something to give them hope. You know, oh, the triumph is coming. You know, great, now I can hope. I'm sure Our Lady's triumph is coming. But our hope is in the kingdom, um, in Jesus. We don't have to worry about what's going on. I have to admit, the world, the situation of the world does look very precarious now. We, in the mid-1980s, when I was a teenager, I thought we would all die in a nuclear conflagration back then. But, you know, President Reagan and uh, Gorbachev made a kind of a peace mm. and communism looked like it was falling apart. And um, the 90s were a great time. We actually thought, it great, there was hope. But this is all a, a kind of a human hope, what human beings can achieve through their own efforts. Our hope must be founded on God, a God who cannot be deceived and does not deceive, a God whose promises are sure. That's that's what we should focus on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you mentioned Reagan and Gorbachev. I mean, I'm just going with the flow here for now. But Maria had something to do with that, didn't she? With a letter or something? I heard about it. There was a good video many years ago, and I can't find it since. There's great detail about it. There was some sort of American diplomat, and I forget which book I read this in, but he he's supposed to have brought a message from Maria to Reagan, and then Reagan is supposed to have arranged something with Gorbachev to see that same message. And um, and they send their thanks. And uh, I don't know much more about it, you know? Uh, it must have been somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe. But then we mustn't rule out the possibility that maybe these presidents, I'm not trying to be the cynical one here, but the devil's advocate, but, but maybe they just send back a, the usual sort of polite letter, like, thank you very much, you know, keep us in your prayers, whatever. And maybe they thought she was just mad. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I'd like to think that they didn't. I'd, I'd like to think they took it seriously, but we don't know exactly everything. If something is second-hand or third-hand, it becomes very dubious. Yeah, exactly. And I do find that with other ones, like Garabandal is probably one of the, the major ones when it comes to the books and authors and this month, this year, and even year, all that stuff. And it seems to be saying third-party sources. But, yeah, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate, I think, for Garabandal, you know, that, um, that man, Joy Lomangino, and his alleged cure was so intimately linked by the people, I think, rather than... I don't think Garibaldal hinges on Joey Lomangino. So, you know, he was the man who was yeah, blind. Yeah, he was blind, and Padre Pio told him to go and things. I did do an interview with uh, Glenn Hudson, who seems to be the, the, the face and voice of the, the apostolate now with Conchita's blessing. But apparently there was a rumour going around, he, has, he says this in video, 
He says they can cheat. There's a rumour going around that Joey offered up that uh, as a sacrifice to bring in the warden quicker. And she says, it's not a rumour, it's what he told me. Oh, really? He's been saying it. Okay. That came from Conchita's mouth. Well, he should have left a written deposition. <laughs> <laughs> well, just last question or so far. Like, with eight years being here, obviously, you're seen as parish priest for the, or chaplain for the English uh, pilgrims. But it would have probably allowed you not just to go out the apparitions as such, but when the crowds are away and you befriend the people of the the parish, even the visionaries, for example, away from everything, the spotlights. Uh, I mean, if you've had any type of heartfelt conversation with any of them, how do, where do they keep it? Where's the reality? You know, the, there's an Australian man that I know, he comes here every now and then, and he's desperate to recover his faith. Okay, and uh, so every time he comes, he's all cynical again, you know, so he, he went and stayed at, one of the so-called hotels here, you know, the, these well, the four-story buildings are hotels. And uh, and uh, the, he looked at the receptionist and convinced himself that this was all a show put on for him, you know, that she wore a cross just as a show. And uh, he asked about mass times and confession, and she knew. And he thought, okay, well, she's memorized it for show. You know, <laughs> and then... Um, he needed something, and she said, well, I'll do that for you after Mass. She said, because I'm going to the evening Mass, and then I'll come back, you know. She said, there won't be cover at the desk for about an hour and a half. And he, again, he persuaded himself, oh, she's just telling me that, you know, for sure. <laughs> and uh, then he, he ordered a taxi. I don't know why, he could have just walked. It's just two minutes down the road. He got, got a taxi came here, and then and the driver said to him, uh, where, where are you going? He said, just to the church. And the driver said, well, I'm going to Mass, so I'll just drop you off, you know, don't worry, I won't charge you. And again, he convinced himself this is all part of the act, you know, the villagers are doing this. <laughs> and, and the driver did this, uh, dropped him off, and then parked his car and then went to Mass as well. And he saw the driver at Mass, and he just couldn't believe that this was all real, that the, the villagers themselves were coming to Mass. And, uh, um, you know, at the times, like the winter months when there's fewer people here, there, there's still pilgrims coming, but it's fewer. It, it's more of a recovery time for the village, you know. We, they have their own time for themselves. They get the village back. And you can see their devotion, you know, the... They all signed up, they petitioned the bishop for perpetual adoration. And the villagers signed up, filled the entire sl all the slots. Um, you know, and they wanted it, they said they wanted it. It hasn't happened yet, but they asked, they asked the bishop and the pastor for this. And hopefully it will happen soon, I hope so. The, you can see the faith for the villagers is very part and parcel of their lives. It's very normal. You know, for example, mm, yeah, I don't want to betray their names, but, um, you know, there are certain famous tennis players <laughs> from Medjugorje, okay? And um, I stayed at the house of, uh, run by the father and brother of one of these tennis players. And, uh, I was astonished myself. This is in the days when I was coming as a pilgrim. Like the brother would go up Apparition Hill every afternoon praying the rosary. Now, how many 22-year-olds, young men, do you know who climb a mountain and pray the rosary every afternoon? You know, and I was a little bit curious, a bit nosy, as being Singaporean. <laughs> and, you know, he said, yeah, Father, I'm, I'm praying for my future wife. And I said, do you have a girlfriend? He said, no, but, you know, I will one day, I hope. <laughs> So I'm just praying for her and some other intentions, you know. And you, you see a lot of that. Or like groups of young men who climb uh, the big mountain every day of Lent, making the Stations of the Cross. And there's no cynicism there, you know. And they're genuinely striving to live uh, holy lives. Like real commitment. I mean, like, and this is a lot of the village uh, that you see doing these kind of things. Um, as a young man I know uh, from my gym, <laughs> he, you know, 
this family from Ireland came and they brought with them uh, a man who's dying, you know, and I, I didn't tell him anything about this. I just, I think they found, they found this place themselves because it's very near to the church. The, the chap who's seriously ill, it's difficult for him to get to Mass otherwise. And uh, that young man who owns that uh, flat, he refused to take any money. You know, one, once he found out this person was seriously ill, he just had no money, and they, they tried to force money on him. I was there when they tried to pay him sneakily, you know, the kind of Irish way of forcing money on you, trying to stick it in your pockets when you when your back turned or something, you know. And he re absolutely refused. But all of that is, that's the villagers, that's what they're like. A lady said to the village, she said, I want you to be a sign to the world as well. You know, I've come for you. And I'm glad that many of them are responding. When I first came here, when I was 20, that's what I saw. Everyone in the evening, absolutely everyone was there at the evening program. Because there, there were no pilgrims because the war was coming here. So there's only a group of man Singaporeans here. And uh, they all prayed the rosary devoutly. They went to confession, they went to mass, and after mass they... They made the Thanksgiving, they had another bit of the rosary as a Thanksgiving or adoration on certain dates and then, and then they went home and had dinner. That's how it worked. So yeah, so the, the village is, is a great sign of conversion. Um, and I long may it be such a sign. And, and, long, and also I hope that many more others in the village will also be such clear signs, you know. It must be difficult for them, you know, the young people who grew up here after the apparitions began. They've never known anything else. Mm. Um, so they also, you know, they, they have to have that personal encounter with Jesus at a certain point. And it's a wonderful thing to see when it does happen, you know, and rather than just... Here, you see, in the culture, everyone goes to Mass anyway. You know, it's going the whole region, so it's easy to do that. It's easy to go to Mass when everyone else goes to Mass. But you, you have to be able to go to Mass when you live far away from home. That's a real test of whether you have the yeah. faith or not. <laughs> you have to willingly pray and seek the sacraments when you're far away. Have you ever took anything like a one-liner or something that's hit your heart with anything that maybe the visionaries have said to you? you could share. Not sensationalism, but something. Because you know, everyone comes, but... They yeah, keep yeah. it real. They're raising families. Yeah. I, I remember the one winter, the visionary Maria, she rang me. And she said, Father, what are you doing? I said, nothing. And she said, come round, we'll have tea. You know, because she, she knows I'm, I'm English. I'm the closest thing to an Englishman here. So, <laughs> so, and actually I have to say, I do drink tea at four o'clock. Because in Singapore, we keep a lot of colonial customs more, more rigorously <laughs> than the bread. So... You know, and I, I love having my tea at four o'clock, tea and biscuits or tea and cake or something. And um, I went over and I thought there'd be a huge crowd there and the usual sort of hullabaloo and, you know, and Maria would be distracted by everyone. But it was just the two of us. She, you know, she was up to her elbows in flour trying to make a cake for us. And I think she's a good cake maker. I don't remember I can't remember what cake we had that day, but anyway. Um, and then she said, you, Father, you are English, you make the tea. So I could, because boiling water is so difficult. But so, I, so I was left in charge of making the tea. And it was just the two of us, um, just chatting about normal, ordinary things. I do make it a point not to speak to the visionaries about Our Lady and their experiences. I do deliberately avoid those conversations because everyone is asking them about that. And this has been like 40 three years of being asked these questions every day, more or less. So I just talk to them about ordinary things. And, um, and you know, like say with Maria, you know, she's, she's very motherly. Um, she's only a few years older than me, but very, very natural. Um, and her faith is so, so much, so connatural with her life. And it's lovely to see, really, really. And um, and she's a great mother as well. I mean, I I know some of her sons. She's got four boys, 
think I've had three of them at least. Um, and you know, and uh, and they have they're good lads. It's very difficult to raise children these days, you know. And she she did tell me once she she that she warned her boy. <laughs> she said, "Don't forget, your mother is a visionary," you know. <laughs> and they are they are good. They're good lads. <laughs> very very good. And that that must be a lot of pressure on them, you know. Like thank God we don't have a married priesthood in the Latin Church. Because if we had such a thing, you know, the, you know, for the man, it's easy enough for him to say it's his vocation. But his wife and kids don't choose that vocation, and they'll be under so much pressure. In, you know, in the, in the parish, all the women will be watching the priest's wife, you know, and and, and watching the priest's children and uh, and judging. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then, of course, if you have if you had married priests, it won't be too long before you have divorced priests. So, so there was them in that actually. There's a whole kettle of fish that you don't want with that, you know. And I think it's mad to say, you know, with a married priests, we'd have priests that were more like us, you know. What, do you think celibate priests are grown in a petri dish? You know, where, where do you think we come from? We come from families. We also know what it's like to have a family and to be in a family, to be part of the family. Yeah. True. But, yeah. So I, I I do I don't like to hear that kind of talk about it. somehow married priests would be more normal, more relatable maybe I don't know. But um, and I think it's absolutely daft to say with married priests we wouldn't have uh, abuse of children or something. When you think well, the vast majority of child abusers are either married men or stepfathers or uncles or older brothers. Vast majority. Yeah. So how is that supposed to reduce these things in the church, in the hierarchy? No, for sure. No, I've read all those reports years gone by, and know the percentages and things, or some of it, because it came up with that abuse scandal time. It's when I really noticed Mariana's, no, well, was it Mariana's message or Maria's monthly message? It was what always emphasised, especially since then, about praying for the priests, because it was the Lord that chose them. For one reason or another, whoever they are, what their journey is, what your suspicions are, yes. they are ordained. Yeah. And, and if, they, if, they're try, if they're trying to be on the side of the angels, they are under attack for sure. Yeah. You know, the priests are being tempted by despair, and the laity are being tempted by cynicism. This is the two-pronged attack by the demonic against the church. To fight the laity with cynicism, to seduce them with cynicism, and for the priests with despair, to think that everything I do is pointless. That's good to know, like to remember that, what to pray against. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that's the line you wanted. But yeah. That's for me. I think you need to know the enemy in order to defeat them. And as well, what military do you know that's not made plans for the war with what other country? You need to know your enemy. Yes, yes. Gather yes. intelligence, counter intelligence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Our lady here encourages us you know, the use of sacramentals, and actually, even my old church in London, uh, where I was before I came here, we always blessed uh, the holy water properly, you know, with the old ritual. The Epiphany? Or, no, or an old Latin ritual? Yeah. You know, we had to exercise the salt first, and then bless the salt, then exercise the water, bless the water, then combine the two, and then there's another final prayer. You know, we did it properly always. Um, I'm not sure why, I think it's just the way we did things, but it's important to do those blessings, you know. I know the old uh, Cardinal Archbishop of uh, Vienna, before Schoenborn, he used to say, when I want holy water, I use the old ritual. If I use the mod I, if I want happy water, I use the modern one. <laughs> because I, I have to admit, the, the modern blessing says something like, it doesn't even bless the water, it just is made this water remind us of our baptism. That's it. Uh, yeah, because I went for Epiphany Sunday to a very traditional, there was the oratory in Birmingham actually, that's where I'm loving now, down Birmingham. So as well, if we see if there's any difference, I'll get some water for the Epiphany water. A good half hour standing there waiting for it to be blessed with all the singing and the words. And it's like, well, if another priest just blesses it like that, then you see all this on the Epiphany water. 
surely there must be a difference of grace given as well based I mean I don't know some people say just bless it and use it but mm-hmm. then you hear a lot of these exorcist priests coming up like and the exorcists say and use, use, the, old, and use the old ritual yeah, yeah. Yes. they're because the demons are showing them that there's a difference yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that's another topic for another time but I do see at the St. Leopold statue you'll you bless different metals religious objects yes. the salts the olive oil yeah, the incense and the incense so all of this stuff we should be using as an arsenal in spiritual warfare so to say I mean I don't want to put a label on it but I mean yeah, it is a, we are all in daily battles them, aren't we them. They're, they're gifts from the church to us so yeah use them brilliant the only last thing I would say for the cynics that might still be watching because the very few that still leave a negative comment about Medjugorje where does it stand with the church just now because I know there's a lot of positive side of that okay the any apparition site, the competence to judge it is the local bishop. It's automatically, you know, this is when the church uh, wants things done. And here, the local bishop, uh, to tell a long story short, Rome removed the right to judge from him um, and gave it to the Yugoslav bishops' conference to judge. So they met in 1991 and gave a judgment. Um, and you know, there are three judgments you can make there. Constant de supernaturalitate. Think of that as a green light. Th- I think of it as traffic lights, okay? So that's green. Okay, okay. That it's, um, it uh, shows signs of supernatural origin. Or there's constant de non supernaturalitate which is like a red light, you know, like, show signs it's not supernatural. And then there's amber, which is non constant de supernaturalitate, which just means doesn't show signs of supernatural, but also doesn't show signs of not being supernatural. Wait, you know what I mean? You, so it's, it's amber, it's really neutral. Uh, and that was the judgment they chose, the amber one. So they left it open. And uh, then the war came, Yugoslavia fell apart. Later on, Rome said, okay, now the competence belongs to the Bosnian and Herzegovinian bishops. And there's only three, so there's three of them who are in charge of judging Medjugorje. But then more recently, 2017, Pope Francis then, you know, the, Pope Benedict had had Cardinal Ruini head a commission to examine Medjugorje. And they drew up the report, submitted it to Rome, to Pope Francis, and um, it was never published. But they leaked versions online. <laughs> you, can read it for, you can read it for yourself. Um, authentic leaked version. I think it's authentic because it's when you read it, it's written in that style of Vatican speak that is very difficult to imitate. Very difficult to imitate, you know? And... Uh, it's a very good document. You know, I think it's it's a, like a model of how we should approach um, apparition sites. So, now, don't get me wrong, it criticizes different things in Medjugorje, but also it, it praises other things and recognizes certain good things and all that. Um, and of course, this is the one where, you know, the rumors came saying, oh yeah, Rome has recognized the first week. Um, it did, it recognized, re- the, the people, they voted, the commission voted, and the vast majority uh, voted in favor of the first week, but also in favor of the second week and the third week as well, but the majority was dropping for the second and third week, but still the majority, I think, for... And they only examined the first three weeks anyway. Right. And, uh, and then it also noted that uh, the, the alleged miracles here of physical healings had not yet been properly examined by a medical bureau, like say Lourdes has a medical bureau, there's nothing like that here yet. So he just said it, that it hasn't been done yet, but of course that got turned into, oh, Rome re- re- says there are zero miracles in Medjugorje. I mean, there, there has to be like a willful malice to you know, deliberately twist yeah. what the commission said. Anyway, but... Uh, I recommend reading this alleged report. I think it, I think it's probably authentic. But after the report was handed to 
Pope Francis, he sent an apostolic visitator here, Bishop Henrik Hoser, who's Polish. And uh, so Bishop Hoser came here as the Pope's representative and, you know, with certain authority. And it seemed to be like, you know, the diocesan bishop, of course, this is his diocese. And Medjugorje, insofar as it was a parish, seemed to come under his uh, purview. And Medjugorje, insofar as it was like a shrine, seemed to, seemed to come under Bishop Hosa. Okay, so the, this was never clearly stated, but it was just that the way they operated and co cooperated, it seemed to be like that. And then uh, the, the ordinary, the Bishop of Mostar, to retire. His resignation was accepted and he was replaced by Bishop Palich. I, I get confused now when he took over. It was around that time. And then um, well, I think maybe Hosea came after Bishop Palich came. Anyway. And then Bishop Hosea died and he was replaced by the one who's here now, Bishop Aldo Cavalli. So there's still an apostolic visitator, you know, trying to normalize certain things in Medjugorje. And of course, the presence of the apostolic visitator is clearly not, is not intended as a validation of Medjugorje, the apparitions and saying we recognize the apparitions. If anything, it's saying we recognize there's a need for pastoral care mm. in Medjugorje. And, you know, so that's why these uh, visitators have been here. So the state of Medjugorje is before 2017, you could come on private pilgrimages to Medjugorje. Now, you can, from 2017 onwards, since May 2017 onwards, you can come on public pilgrimages. So a bishop or a priest can organize an, a, a pilgrimage to Medjugorje and bring people here, lead them here. It's not forbidden. So we're in that kind of state that, say, Lourdes and Fatima were between the apparition and the approval. Okay, you know, where the church is just watching to see, are people going to come? Are they being converted? Are they returning to the sacraments? That's what one was watching and seeing before people ever issue a judgment on this. And also it does, I don't know who has the competence to judge in Medjugorje now. Of course, Rome always does. But presumably with the apostolic visitator, maybe, maybe Rome has reserved their right to herself no, but I don't know. Maybe, or maybe it's the bishops of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But I'm not sure. Well, thanks for your honesty, because you came at balanced and honest, and you're not trying to just side or promote it, promote it. You've been you're very honest with it, which is all people go on. Thank you. Well, well, I, we have to be, a, we should be. Yeah. You know, um, Holy Mother Church hasn't made a decision, a judgment, but in the meantime, we're in this period where we are being open to God's grace. Mm -hmm. I, I'll end on this note, you know, when I was first sent out here, my Dominican brothers asked me three questions about Medjugorje. They said, number one, um, how do people behave at Mass? And uh, Number two, what are confessions like? Oh. And number three, are the Franciscans greedy for money? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's not because of Medjugorje, they're just a traditional Dominican suspicion of Franciscans in general. <laughs> we, you know, over the centuries we tease each other. Well, tease on a good day, but in the past it, uh, we had a rivalry. But no, I think there's great cooperation between our two orders. And I told them, you know, Mass and Confessions, what it's like here. I thought, great, it's marvelous. And uh, as for Franciscans and money, I don't know why they have that reputation. I think it's the anti Medjugorje propaganda out there, or polemic, you know, that says things in. The Franciscans here could not care less. You know, they receive me as one of their own. They live fairly ordinary lives. They're not obsessed by stupid things, and material things and all that. Thank God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, so for me, and when I answered that to the Dominicans, they said, look, this is great, we should cooperate with the grace of God wherever it manifests, you know. And they said, it's not up to us to judge Medjugorje, but here God's grace is clearly at work, so we seek to cooperate with it. That's it. Very sensible and Dominican way of looking at things. 
Yeah, very good. I was just going to say, if you, I always give the guest the opportunity, if you want to say it, based on everything we've discussed, like a final word to your viewers and followed by a, an end in prayer or blessing, even if you don't Sure, know. should I break the fourth wall? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what would I say? I would say to the viewers, if you want to come to Medjugorje, pray about it and see what happens and see where Our Lady leads you. But the most important thing is... I encourage you to live your faith, to get a catechism, a printed copy of the catechism, read it cover to cover, live the faith, live the sacraments. Here in Medjugorje, we talk about the five stones, and they're just ordinary Catholic practices, which, you know, if you were living the first Friday and first Saturday devotions, you'd be automatically living the so-called five stones of Medjugorje. So the Medjugorje and Fatima just go together so well, and they are, Treasure the Mass. Go to Mass as often as you can, you know, daily Mass if you can. And to go early and prepare your hearts with silence before Mass, never to leave Mass without making a thanksgiving. To pray the Rosary daily and to pray the complete Rosary every day. And I, I firmly believe that every single one of you is capable of this. And if you think you're too busy, I, I don't mean to offend, but I think you're fooling yourself at some level. Or you're doing things that are not so important to you. It would be more important, it would be more valuable if you prayed the rosary. Number three, to read the Bible every day, especially the Gospels. This is so important, especially at a time when many Catholics come up with their own fantasy Jesus rather than the real Jesus. Read the Gospels, be familiar with the Gospels through and through, but read the Bible. Number four, fast Wednesdays and Fridays. And if you're not willing, well, first of all, pray for the grace to be able to fast and make sacrifices. Have that penitential spirit. And not to make a fuss about this, don't boast about this, but just to pray for this grace and then get on with it. And five, to confess at least once a month. You would need to do that if you're keeping the first Friday and first Saturday devotion because you'd have to go to confession recently. Plus minus three weeks uh, is how the church phrases it to get the uh, indulgence um, and uh, presumably that applies and I think that applies to the first Friday and first Saturday devotion as well so to go to confession regularly to be in the habit of confessing not to not to see confession as a chore or something difficult but as a, a joyful encounter with the merciful Jesus this is what I would encourage with all of you for those of you who happen to be against Medjugorje, remember we are blind to believe the Catholic faith and to believe Jesus. Strengthen your faith. Let your ask for a great uh, deepening of your faith in Jesus. Whether you believe in Medjugorje or not is is not the point. Be a fervent Catholic. Be on fire for Jesus, and live that faith not out of any sort of perfunctoriness or ticking the boxes, as I said earlier, but really out of love for Jesus. Let it be a living relationship for you. Um, I know maybe for some of you it scares you because this sort of language is possibly associated with charismatics or something and you're against charismatics. Um, I don't care what you're against or what you're for, so long as you're for Jesus. And I want you to have a living faith. I would like everyone out there to be on fire in this way and not just to go through the motions because I know what it's like to go through the motions myself because it is a sad and empty life even when you believe all the right things and are even trying to do all the right things but without that extra oomph or that fire that the Holy Spirit gives us. So that is my prayer for all of you as well. And I want to end this by imparting a blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless all of you through the intercession of Our Lady, Queen of Peace, St. Joseph, St. Michael, and all your patron saints. May the Lord deepen your faith and encourage you in your journey. May he give you a firm faith and a fervent hope that will keep you and guard you until the end of your days. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for it. It's been wonderful. I'm very humbled and uh, grateful. Thank you. You're welcome.